Welcome back. Um, I'll continue be uh, continue weaving the lattice pattern, and like I said, I'll be doing the same things, demonstrating the same uh, way of weaving uh, I I have for the last couple of days, and um, I know that can get monotonous, and so I am um, beefing up my my uh, demonstrations by telling history and stories and uh, all that other good stuff. So um, I touched briefly on the fact that the um, Spanish were the first ones who came to visit us and uh, discovered us um, in 1774. Um, Juan Perez was sent up here by um, Viceroy, Viceroy uh, Bucarelli, and um, so um, he was viceroy of the um, uh, what was called New Spain, and now we call that Mexico. So, um, so our first introduction to uh, outsiders were um, a big ship uh, full of people who were probably even browner than us, right? And so. Um, unlike the Hawaiians, who um, rumor said, has it that they were thinking that Cook was a, a god or, or something, but um, as Haidas, um, we saw these brown people who came to our shores in a huge bo uh, ship. Um, but probably that ship wasn't too surprising because the northern Clinkets, in their very northern part of their territory, uh, did have contact with people who had seen the Russians. And it's possible that the Clinkets may have even seen the Russians themselves. Um, and so they probably came down with this rumor and uh, uh, news of um, these large ships that were wind pushed at the time. And um, anyway, it's all very exciting, that history. So I'm going to, I'll just because it's so important about that first contact for the whole Northwest Coast, actually. Um, it was so important that I think that um, I'll just go back and talk more about that first contact and what those people saw. So that I'll do that as I'm weaving. But I think that sometime um, I'll probably stop weaving and just uh, I'll read you some of, some of the passages that uh, are so important um, when they document the fact of uh, what these people were wearing. And uh, Juan Perez stopped here in 1774, right, right here up in North Island. But after that, when uh, he couldn't get water, he couldn't, it was too rocky where he was intending to, uh, to anchor and go on to shore, he couldn't do that. He didn't get even his water that he needed. Um, so, he was only here for maybe two days at the most, and then <clears throat> and then headed back south because uh, he wasn't uh, going further north because his people were sick of scurvy and all. So he did stop in the New Chinooth, uh territories. So he stopped where um, Captain Cook would two years later, or no, four years later, Captain Cook would stop. Um, so we do have observations from Juan Perez in the New Chinooth area, and I want to talk about that too. So thank you. I hope you enjoy uh, the weaving and the stories. Okay, so I am over here starting a new row. And um, on the black, it's just I'm simply doing a two-color, two-strand technique. I'm sending the blue back behind or behind and then the black in the front. And like I said, I have these braids and this is a this would be a a braided three strand and it's not a simple three strand like you would call the um the um Raven's tail three strands. So this top one goes to the left of the middle one and to the right of the bottom one. So it weaves in between its partners. Sometimes these slip knots get 
tangled up and you just have to slip knot them again. Okay, so um, I was going to start talking about uh, more on the um, Spanish. So Juan Perez was actually a very experienced pilot. He had gone, he had been a pilot across the uh, Pacific Ocean um, because uh, the Spanish had a um, colony in the Philippines. And so for 200 years before the um, Spanish even came up north, they were going across the Pacific Ocean on big Manila um, ships. So, uh, or, or they were going to Manila. <clears throat> and uh, so they took advantage of the winds and the currents. And um, after 200 years, they uh, learned uh, how to get across that ocean uh, by taking advantage of the currents. So a lot of times, uh, with each season, a different the di different currents occur. So anyway, so he was a pretty experienced pilot on the on in the in the Pacific. So that was probably why he got assigned to uh, be the captain for the for the trip up to uh, up up to Alaska. So. Um, he came out of uh, San Blas, which is a port where the Santiago, the ship he was being captain of, the Santiago um, um, was built right there in San Blas. And uh, so then he came up, San Blas is um, in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, up, you know, down and around that peninsula, and then there's that San Blas. Um, so he came up north because the Spanish had heard that the Russians were coming. They had heard rumors out of St. Petersburg that the Russian explorers were going to um, go there and um, make claims and the Spanish felt like that was their territory and they didn't want anybody into making claims in their territory. So when they went up, they went up also um, with two Franciscan friars who were, their responsibility was, um, of course, the spiritual well-being of the people on the boat. And then there was also uh, the Spanish always had the garrison, the army garrison, so they had uh, um, officers um, and uh, but the friars kept the people pretty pretty well um, in um, in line for uh, for doing right so. And also, Bucarelli sent uh, in instructions with um, sent instructions that the uh, Perez should treat any indigenous people they meet. They should treat them with kindness. Um, and they and even though they were just they were explorers, they weren't traders, but they brought gifts and uh, for these people. And one of the reasons why they would have brought gifts was because these people on the boats, they needed wood and they needed water. Well, it's, it's, um, we all would have, can understand why they would need water. But um, back in the day, they really needed the extra wood too because their uh, furnaces for uh, feeding people for cooking and for all of the uh, energies that you would need on the boat um, for, per for preparing food um, would require the wood. So uh, they needed to get off their boat and chop down wood 
So, um, so they bring these gifts to appease whoever they were taking things from um, to make friends. So uh, even though they were just explo or explorers, they, they still brought things to. I want to talk that, that we're dealing with uh, two. Every time I, I enter there, I'm setting up for two rows. And um, uh, um, so here we are, we, we have two weavers. But uh, when I start out there, if you notice, um, I would be having one row across the little blue beginning there. Um, so I'm weaving one row and then I start weaving and it, and it splits to become two rows. So sometimes you have to do an extra little free row back and forth in the beginning to keep that level uh, straight. So that's uh, something you'd have to consider when you're doing um, this technique where you enter, you weave, then you, then you enter uh, another uh, group of yarn and then you're working two rows. Uh, so they came along our coast. They, he was sent, his instructions were to go all the way up to 60 degrees north. Well, we're not 60 degrees north. We're about, uh, our island is big. So we're going from about uh, 52 degrees, 50, 50 degrees, 52 degrees, all the way up to um, 54 degrees. Uh, and then even Southeast Alaska, maybe 55 degrees. So anyway, our territories um, uh, were there, but, but um, he ran out of water and wood. Well, mostly water, I think. Um, and so that's why he went into um, and, and landed and, and went towards our island. So, um, first of all, I think he touched closer to southeast Alaska and then um, just zigzagging back and forth between, you know, in the entrance of Dixon Entrance and um, <clears throat> Southeast Alaska, and then the northern Haida Gwaii here. So he, um, but he communicated with the people up in, in North Island. And when he saw them, they came out uh, from around the, an island, and he, they um, were holding their hands out. They, he, they talk about these people were standing up there were uh, people who stood up in the canoe and they held their hands out um, as like a like a um, like a cross. And uh, of course, the uh, Franciscan friars are documenting all of this, and so of course they would write that it, they they appeared as if they were um, uh, creating a cross. But they came out with their amazing robes and singing songs in unison. The paddlers were paddling in unison. They were, um, they stopped and when they stopped, the paddles became drumsticks where they would um, pound the hull of their, their uh, paddles and uh, accompany the singers. And um, so they sang and they drummed on with their paddles and they ceremoniously uh, circled around the big ship. So um, there was quite a lot of ceremony in greeting these strangers. And the people were very impressed with the Haida people and how they, um, they had the rituals and the singing and the ceremony and the rich clothes. And uh, one of the... Um, one of the chroniclers, one of the uh, Franciscan um, friars, were um, had had been on the uh, land trek from the California Baja up to San Diego, and so he said uh, in his chronicling of that first contact, he said that these people, oh, I gotta go back, these people uh, came from a hilltop 
and in that hilltop, then um, they uh, sang out. And actually, they didn't even say they sang out. They said they harangued them um, from a hilltop, and that they were wearing headdresses and uh, a short skirt of um, of um, probably agave uh, material. The skirt was made out of agave material. In my research, um, I've, I've studied that they, that's what they wore in the in the past. So that's what the um, Franciscan friar had seen. So now they're up in Haida Gwaii, and out come these huge uh, canoes with um, as many as I don't know, they, they're like 60 feet uh, and five feet uh, um, wide, and um, and they're standing there with these uh, magnificently robed chiefs, and these people are singing uh, greetings, and um, they were quite impressed with with the Haidas. I've got to move this again, and I, hopefully it won't fall. Okay, so um, so they didn't stay very long, and they didn't really land or anything like that. So they didn't have their ceremony of sovereignty. So they usually would keep a big, a big um, uh, wooden cross, and the the friars would go on shore, and the garrison, the armies, they would. Um, along with the uh, friars, conduct a ceremony of sovereignty um, with the newly discovered land. And the reason why they thought that they could... Oops. The reason why they thought that they could do that is, like I said earlier, there was a papal in. Uh, declaration in um, 1400s where a pope uh, told the Portuguese that they they could control this part of the world and the Spanish could control this part of the world and um, it's crazy so here they thought that because the um, the Haidas were not Christians that their land was they they didn't have rights to their land. Only Christians had rights to um, the lands of the world, and um, so they thought that they had the right to take the land in and declare it the Spanish. Well, the Haidas the uh, they didn't land and they didn't raise a wooden cross in 1774. So instead, they they uh, figure. They figure, okay, it, they didn't get water they, because of it being very um, a rough terrain. So they decided they would go down to um, the Nuchanuth area in um, near Nootka. What, what they, um, well, I don't know if they even called it Nootka yet, but um, anyway, they went down to the Nuchanuth area, and um, and in their um, reporting of their visit there we get more information about Haida, what the Haida wore, because they, in their descriptions, they compare uh, the Haidas with the Nuchanut people. So we really get uh, an interesting, um, uh, more information. And so that's what's so uh, fun about reading these old uh, things is that you don't think you're going to learn something about your own people uh, by reading about their visit down there in, in another people's territory. But the reading further into his document, I learned some more about the Haida and what the Haida wore compared to what the Nuchanuth wore. So um, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to read you uh, some 
uh, direct quotes, direct um, uh, words from these explorers who first saw the Haidas. So, uh, let me read you the very first thing that they saw, the very first sighting of the Haidas or of any Northwest Coast people. And we noticed that a canoe came out from a break in the land like the mouth of a river and was paddled towards the ship. While it was still distant from the vessel, we heard the people in it singing. And by the intonation, we knew that they were pagans. For it was the same sung at the dances of pagans from San Diego to Monterey. Presently, they drew near to the ship and we saw that they were eight men and a boy. Seven of them were paddling. The other, who was advanced in years, was upright and making dancing movements, throwing several feathers into the sea. They made a turn about the ship. So um, they came out. Um, I suspect that that wasn't, um, that may have been the Spanish first sighting, but that the Haidas had already sighted them, knew what was, knew and had observed them from afar and then came out ceremoniously to greet them. So um, it wasn't like they were unsuspecting greeters. They, they came out very bravely, very boldly to greet this huge ship uh, that came to their shore. So, um, so they, so they uh, during that day, they greet them. There's a few, a few um, canoes, I think two or maybe at the most three, but um, then they go away. I'm just, they made agreements with hand movements that they would see them the next day, right? That they would continue their introductions the next day and, and all. So, um, but then, the um, Haidas hear them singing on board their boat. And probably they were wondering, why are they singing now? Why didn't they sing to us when we were there singing to them with their ceremony? So, um, but I, the friars were probably conducting a, a service, a Catholic service on board. So, um, so the Haidas get back in their canoe and go to visit them that evening. So after the canoes had gone away and night had fallen, we were all reciting the rosary of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. We again heard singing. This proceeded from another canoe which drew near with the same ceremonies observed by the others. Seeing that no attention was paid to them because we were at prayers, the people in the canoe began to cry out and it continued shouting until such time as the daily recital of the rosary and special prayers to some saints were concluded, and the hymn of praise, which caused great admiration on their part, was sung. As it was now dark, the captain ordered lights to the side of the frigate, and we saw that another canoe containing seven pagans had arrived. They were asked to come aboard, but either they did not wish to do so, or they did not understand the signs made to them. They were given some little things of trifling value and gave us, in return, some dried fish, which seemed, which seemed to be cod, although it was whiter. So probably it was dried halibut that they uh, they uh, tra or gifted the Spanish. So um, I just love that part of the story because I could just hear, I could just imagine them hearing that singing and saying, "What's that about? Maybe they are summoning us to go trade." And so they get back on their on their canoes and they go out and they see these people on deck singing. And they're impressed with those songs, you know, and, and that was interesting. But that the, um, the ceremony was so solemn and such a ritual that even though these canoes were coming back to see them and to trade with them or to uh, communicate with them, they still stayed right on track with their prayers and until, uh, until the prayers were over. And then they paid attention to the haidas that came to them. So um, that was real interesting. 
So then the next day, the next day, uh, there's a lot of canoes that come out to see them that next day because news gets around. And in that area up near North Island, there's quite, there was quite a lot of um, traditional uh, villages in that area. There was Yak, Yaku, there was, um, the word spread. And there was uh, Custa and Dodden's. And um, so we had lots of canoes and lots of chiefs come out to see these people. So um, I'll read uh, a uh, passage about that. Okay. Now this comes from uh, an excerpt from Friar Crespi's daily journal. Okay. He says, they drew close to the ship, surrounding her on all sides, and presently there began between them and our people a traffic. And we soon knew that they had come for the purpose of bartering their supplies for ours. The sailors gave them knives, old clothing, and beads, and they in return gave skins of the otter and other animals unknown, very well tanned and dressed, coverlets of otter skins, sewn together so well that the best tailor could not sew them better, other coverlets or blankets of fine wool, or the hair of animals that seemed like wool, finely woven and ornamented with the same hair of various colors, principally white, black, and yellow, the weaving being so close that it appeared as though done on a loom. All these coverlets were have around the edge a fringe of some thread twisted, so they were very fit for tablecloths or covers, as if they had been made for that purpose. They gave us also some little mats, seemingly made of fine palm leaves, wrought in different colors, some hats made of reeds, some coarse, and others of better quality, most of them painted, their shape being, as I have said, conical with a narrow brim and having a string which passed under the chin keeps the hat from being carried away by the wind. All appeared with the body completely covered, some with skins of otter and other animals, others with cloaks woven of wool or hair which looked like fine wool and a garment like a cape and covering them to the waist. The rest of the persons being clothed in dressed skins or the woven woolen cloths of different colors in handsome patterns. Some of these garments have sleeves, others have not. Most of them wore hats of reeds, such as I have described. The women are clothed in the same manner. So they get it a little mixed up about what kind of material we're using for our hats. They're not reeds, they're cedar bark hats. And the finer ones he talks about, the fi uh, finer quality ones, were probably the um, spruce root hats. So, but in that one uh, description, there's so many wool uh, garments. And uh, and not e not just the chiefs are wearing them, it's like, Everybody is wearing wool garments, and and um, and just and the women too. So um, it's just really interesting. But it talked about how they went down to Nuchanuth, and I learned some things about um, a height of clothing through just they're comparing the heights with the Nuchanuth people. So um, I just want to read a little bit about what they say about the Nuchanuth people. And they encountered the, them in uh, August um, 7th through the 9th in 1774. So August. So um, the Indians then came within speaking distance, and this is the Nuchanuth people. And they started their trading by an exchange of furs for shells, which our men brought from Monterey. They, the sailors, got in return various sea otter skins and many sardines. The Indians differed in appearance from those at Santa Margarita. So the Spanish uh, named our island Santa Margarita. So um, that's what he's referring to. So uh, the Indians differed in appearance from those at Santa Margarita. The pelts they wore not being placed against 
the body. So, and here's another one from Tom, uh, Fray, Fray Thomas de la Pina, who is the um, the uh, junior uh, friar. And presently they came to us and began to trade with our people what they brought in their canoes, which consisted only of skins of otters and other animals, hats of rushes, painted and with the crown pointed, and cloths woven of a kind of hemp, having fringes of the same, with which they clothed themselves, most of them wearing a cape of this material. Our people bought several of these articles in exchange for old clothes, shells, which we had brought from Monterey, and some knives. For these and the shells, they manifested greater liking. We did not see cloths woven of wool among them, as at Santa Margarita, nor are they so fully clothed as were those natives. So um, I got that from a book that was written by Cutter and Griffin Butler. So, um, but I also uh, I also went to Yale, uh, the Meineke Library, and I was able to see one of those friars' original um, diaries leather bound and it was what a, a great experience right so um so we get that the new Chinooth are wearing cedar clothing they call them uh hemp but it was cedar clothing and then they comment that they're not wearing the woolen clothing that they saw up north at, with the Haidas so this is August so it's possible that um they uh, didn't bring out their wool clothing, uh, that they were wearing their summer cedar clothing, and that maybe it was hot. I don't, I don't really know um, why they didn't see wool clothing. Because four years later, when Cook comes, he sees wool clothing at, with the new Chinooth. And I'd really like to, like maybe tomorrow, I'll talk to you about uh, what Cook saw, because Cook was actually the first person to document uh, a new Chinooth person weaving on a loom. And he's weaving um, a cedar, a cedar garment. But he um, also talks about how he assumes probably that these people also weave the wool garments by the same manner. And it's really interesting because they're not using that southern loom. They're weaving like us northern people. So tomorrow I'll talk about that. I'm sorry I didn't get as much weaving uh, demo as usual, but I hope that you enjoyed some of this history. Hello.